Hi there. I'm just having fun with the camera. This is known as reading between the lines. The name of this is Two Points Abaft the Beam, which is our way of saying a plain version, or plain language version of the rules of the road. There are within the rules of the road a number of things that are covered, and for most people coming into a course, they think everything in the world is covered under the rules of the road. We want to be specific about covering those that are listed as rules of the road, and because it's a little complicated in government language, we're going to try to simplify it. And if you look in your notebook, and it's probably six or seven pages in the back of your book, one given to you by the school, you'll find, oh, six, seven pages, uh, a, a sheet that, that had that two points of after beam that you just saw on the camera. Two points of after beam. And that's the section we're going to do. It's about 17 pages. And it will deal with the rules of the road so they're understandable. I want you to read with me in the book. Very often I'll go back and I'll point out um, a particular paragraph in case I thought I might have lost you. Now the problem will be as you go through this that sometimes I'm reading and you're reading with me and then sometimes I need to explain. I haven't figured out how to do that yet, but I think I'll use my finger and I'll read with my finger as I go. And as I read with my finger, you'll read, and when I get my hands away from the book and look at you, then we're talking about something that isn't in the book. I don't want you to, to be looking for that paragraph that I'm talking about that doesn't exist. Okay? So we're going to do two things. We're going to read with the book. You're going to follow with me. I'll tell you to underline occasionally. I'll tell you to write in a word. And I want you to use that book as a guide for this. Let me break at this point for a second and have you make an adjustment. So now, once again, when I'm pointing with my finger and I'm reading from the book, you'll read with me. When I stop, you'll know I've stopped and I'm talking to you. And then we'll go back to the book and I'll give you the page and the paragraph number. Don't want to lose you. Let's start top of page one where it says rules of the road. International rules are called the 72 coal regs. That stands for 1972 Collision Regulations which went into effect five years later in 1977 in cooperation with the United Nations Group, IMO, which stands for International Maritime Organization. Just wanted to explain to you why there was a difference in the name 72 coal regs and the fact that they went into effect in 77. People talk about the 1977 rules, but they are the 72 coal regs collision regulations. Back at the book. Meters and feet. Many people are concerned with this because they're afraid that the metric system will hurt them. It really won't. A meter is a little longer than a yard. For the rules, it is rounded off to 3.3 feet equals one meter. So if you take a yard and add a little, you got it. Seven meters is approximately 23 feet. 50 meters, 165 feet. 12 meters, 40 feet. 100 meters, 330. 20 meters, 65. And 200 meters, 656. Now, <clears throat> I'm not asking you to memorize that. If you come to a situation where you have to explain or you have to convert a size, then all you really have to worry about is 3.3 times the feet gives you the meters or vice versa. You can figure that out, okay? Just think of meters as yards and a little bit. Rule one, where they apply. Now this is rule one of the rules of the road. International rules apply to all vessels, all vessels, upon the high seas and in all waters connected therewith navigable by seagoing vessels. What is that going to leave out? <clears throat> Little enclosed ponds, rivers that don't go anywhere and connect with anything else. We're talking about connected to navigable waters. Back at the book. Further, these rules shall not interfere with special rules made by an appropriate authority. <clears throat> a proper authority in the U.S. would be U.S. Coast Guard. And in 1985, obviously we're dated here because we're already in 87, but you could read that as in, in, in 1987, there is one other such set of rules called the Inland Navigational Rules Act of 1980, which went into effect on December 24, 1981. So when everybody says, well, when are the rules changed? They changed in December or Christmas of 1981 for the inland rules. 
there were before, and you've heard mention of the Great Lakes rules, the Western Rivers, which is not out west, which is the Mississippi. So we had international, inland, Western Rivers, Great Lakes. Now we've taken those three, we've called them the unified rules now, we've taken Western Rivers, Inland, and Great Lakes and combined them into one set which we refer to as the Inland Rules. Rule number two, responsibility. Known as the rule of good seamanship and the general prudential rule. Nothing in these rules shall exonerate any vessel, owner, captain, or crew from penalty for neglect of complying with the rules or by the ordinary practice of good seamanship or by the special circumstances of the case. Now, before we go much further, I want you to underline the words special circumstance. Or if you have a highlighter, a yellow highlighter color, highlight those words because they're important to you as we go through the example. In following the rules, due regard shall be given to all dangers of navigation and collision and to any special circumstance which may make a departure from these rules necessary to avoid immediate danger. I want you to underline necessary to avoid immediate danger. Now we're going to talk, before we go any further, stop with the book. Let's talk about what we've just said. This is jokingly referred to as Catch-22. It says you will follow the rules as they apply. However, if special circumstance occurs, which means something not covered under the rules specifically, then it says it may be necessary to depart from the rules. So you follow the rules under law, but if something happens that isn't covered by the rules, then you are required by the rules to depart from the rules to avoid an accident. I can think of a lot of instances where it might happen where you've been told that it's your obligation to hold course and speed. However, this rule says you can't have an accident. Whatever happens by the rules to cause an accident was improper. Therefore, you should have departed from the rules to avoid that accident. It's very hard not to be wrong in an accident, even if you weren't really at fault to begin with, because here's a situation where it says, don't have an accident. If the rules will cause it, depart from the rules. The word is special circumstance, and you might want to make a little note out there where it says special circumstance. You might want to put a little asterisk in a note, something not covered under the rules. That's a tricky phrase, and you'll find another phrase similar to that later that'll confuse you. So we want special circumstance, something not planned under the rules. There was a good example of maybe three vessels coming together at the same point. All the rules, and of course we haven't done them yet, but you'll find all the rules involve two vessels meeting, crossing, and overtaking, which are the normal situations. And when you have, like we have here, three vessels coming together at one point, then we can't have special rights of way. Then we have a situation called a special circumstance where three vessels coming together Obviously, they're not going to be this close, but three vessels coming together are not covered under the rules and would require this rule to go in effect, rule two, which says depart from the rules to avoid immediate danger. I belabored that. Let's go on. Back to the book. We're going to that section that says general definitions, rule three. Now we're going to talk about what the definition is under the rules. It says vessel. The word vessel includes every description of watercraft used or capable of being used as a means of transportation on the water. Some examples are hovercraft, hydrofoils, and seaplanes. Now, obviously, this isn't the whole selection of vessels, hovercraft, hydrofoils, and seaplanes, but it says these are some examples that you don't want to forget because they are considered vessels, and a seaplane is a vessel when it's on the water. Next one. Power boat. The term power-driven vessel means any vessel propelled by machinery. Doesn't say diesel, gas, steam. It says propelled by machinery. I want you to remember that it is being propelled by machinery. Let's go to the next page, page two. Top of the page says composite unit. The term composite unit refers to a special built two-part hull that when joined by hydraulic rams is considered a power boat rather than a towing situation. 
I'll give you an example of what it might be. I know that over in Tampa Bay, I have seen the large barge looking steel vessel at the dock where they are loading in scrap steel. Meantime, there's a squarish looking unit moved away from that, moving under its own power to pick up another unit that it can move around. Let's say for instance, let me give you a scenario. Vessel comes over from Germany with an empty front end and moves over to the dock to take on scrap steel. The back end moves away, goes take a loaded one standing by the dock and heads for Germany. Meanwhile, this crane is keep adding scrap steel to this hull. The vessel gets over to Germany, disconnects the loaded one, picks up an empty front end, comes back to Tampa about that time they filled up and moved over the loaded front end. He drops off the empty front end, picks up the loaded one, goes to Germany. If you think about that cycle, one crew can keep this ship working constantly. There's not a five or six day layover while they're loading the vessel and unloading it. The other scenario would be a single ship comes here, waits while they load the scrap, goes over to Germany, waits while they offload it, comes back and you have downtime. With a removable power section or power plant or living section on a front end, a vessel then is working more often. But it is a composite in that the motorized or back end section is not made to run in the water by itself. They can disconnect it, it can move over, pick up another unit, but it's not made to tow. I'm pointing this out because I don't want you to confuse it with what we call a deep notch or a deep slot towing, where um, a company like Sonat would have a large barge with a deep slot in it and then the tow boat would move up into the slot, lock in and move the barge around. Common called deep notch or deep slot towing uh, moves oil all over the United States, all over the foreign countries. But this is not, this is not a composite unit. A composite unit would be a special locked in unit that matches up and that's locked in with rams and there's no movement between these two units. It becomes then one ship. Belabored enough, composite unit refers to a special built two part hull that when joined by hydraulic rams as opposed to ropes and chains and other methods is considered a power boat rather than a towing situation. Single ship. Okay, we're still now on the second paragraph of page two under sailboats. Sailing vessel is any vessel under sail provided that propelling machinery, if fitted, is not being used. They're saying a sailboat can be one that has a power plant as long as the power plant is not functioning and the sails are propelling the vessel. The minute we turn on the motor, whether the sails are up or not, especially if they're up, it is no longer considered a power boat, but if being propelled by machinery, even by both wind and machinery, is considered a power boat. Fishing vessel. Engaged in fishing means any vessel fishing with nets, lines, trawls, or other apparatus which restrict maneuverability. This definition does not include skipping trolling lines on the water. You got the flat lines running out and you got the mullet wrapped up and you're towing or the, the, the fancy lures that are bouncing on the waters and you are plowing hoping that some marlin or billfish comes up and takes them and your maneuverability is not restricted. That is, you can turn and so the Coast Guard says, or the rules of the road say, excuse me, United Nations says, that's not fishing. If you could normally maneuver then it's not considered fishing and you can't claim the right of way of a fishing vessel. Now I know, and you know when you go out with those trolling lines, you say you're fishing. And in truth, you are fishing. But under the rules of the road, that does not give you, that type of fishing does not give you any special rights of way. However, when you have gear in the water and when you have fish hooked on lines, you are now considered to be engaged in fishing and with proper lights or day shape, to tell the rest of the world that you're doing this, you can claim rights of way that will get other vessels not to crowd you for your space in the water. With not under command. Vessel not under command means a vessel 
which through some exceptional circumstance is unable to maneuver as required by the rules and is therefore unable to keep out of the way of another vessel. I want you to underline exceptional circumstance and I want you to remember that in rule two we talked about special circumstance and I told you there'd be another word that would confuse you and it's exceptional circumstance. So you must keep these two separated in your mind. The first one was not covered by the rules. This one, exceptional, exceptional, is an unplanned breakdown. You might want to put a little note out there. Exceptional circumstance means an unplanned breakdown. I don't want to, I want you to believe that you couldn't plan the breakdown. You couldn't find that the engine needed maintenance out at sea and you decide to shut them down and take the head off the diesel, but still it wasn't a function that you really planned to do out there, even though you did it intensely. So exceptional circumstance under not under command is usually related to an a unplanned breakdown as opposed to something you'd plan. I get that straight with you now? Special circumstance has to do with something not covered by the rule an exceptional circumstance has to do with an unplanned breakdown. Keep them straight in your mind. The next one is restricted inability to maneuver. Vessel restricted inability to maneuver means that a vessel from the nature of her work is unable to keep out of the way of another vessel. Uh, please underline nature of her work for RAM. Note that on the test there's a lot of questions that will suggest that other situations are called restricting the ability maneuver. If it doesn't fall under this one, it is not. For instance, a vessel fishing, which has its own lights and shape, could not under the rules be considered a vessel restricted in ability to maneuver. And we're talking about proper titles. We're not talking about what you think, but what the book says. Some situations that are considered RAM are engaged in underwater construction or operations, dredging or surveying, laying cable or pipe, a Coast Guard vessel working on aids to navigation, transferring cargo underway, military vessels launching planes or minesweeping operations, and towing when, underline when, when it restricts ability to deviate from the course. That means that every towing situation is not, in effect, an RAM situation unless it restricts the ability to maneuver, I guess as determined by the captain, and he hangs up the right day shapes or lights to indicate that. The next one on the page is constrained by draft. The term vessel constrained by draft means a power-driven vessel which because of a draft in relation to the depth of water is restricting the ability to deviate from a course she is following and it is not in the inland rules. So let me give you a little for instance on the board. Here is some shallow water out here and the bottom drops off and we have a dredged channel. Come up in a little shallow. We got a marker out here. And we got one out here, and the big ship is coming in the channel. And so a big ship, because it takes a lot of water, is saying, I don't want to go to the edge of the channel. I may bounce on here. Because I'm a big ship, and there's not a lot of clearance below me, I'm probably going to stick to the center of the channel, and I'm telling you, that by this day shape or lights that I am constrained by the draft of my vessel. Now, obviously it could be a phosphate carrier going out the channel, deep draft, hugging the bottom, and uh, next week it could come back in the channel, unloaded and floating high and no longer be constrained by draft in the same channel. Because now it's not dragging as much water, doesn't need as much water beneath it, and feels more comfortable in the channel. So constrained by draft is probably a temporary situation and it is only used in international rules because obviously if they allowed it in inland rules everybody would claim it and it is a right of way signified by day shape or lights. Back on page two at the bottom where it says underway defined. Not at anchor made fast to the shore or ground. That's underway, not at anchor made fast to the shore or ground. You got to be connected to the bottom to be 
No, I'm sorry, you've got to be unconnected from the bottom to be underway. A vessel with anchor dragging is said to be underway. A vessel being towed is underway. Over top of page 3. Vessel tied to a vessel which is tied to the dock is not underway. This is a good place to note that there are two types of underway. Underway making way, moving with power through the water, and underway not making way, become dead in the water, drift, sinking, and burning. It's hard to remember. Remember, underway making wake and not making wake. If you are drifting, you are underway, but you're not making way. If you are plowing through the water, you're underway making way. And that's important to the rules. First, we decide if you're tied to the ground, and if you're not, then there's two types of underway, moving through the water and not moving through the water. Good time to take a little coffee break. We're still on page three. Let's do restricted visibility. We're still doing definitions now, Rules Road. Means any condition in which visibility is restricted by fog, mist, falling snow, heavy rainstorm, smoke, or any other similar cause. <clears throat> Rule number four says conduct of vessels. The rules in this section apply to any condition of visibility. See, we've, we've done away with the rule. We said there were about 38, I don't know if I said it, but the 38 rules, but a lot of them really aren't rules. They just refer to the other rules like the rules in the section apply to any conditions of visibility. That in itself is not a rule. That is, it doesn't tell you something. It just explains the following rules. Rule number five, look out. Look out! Are you awake? Okay. Every vessel is required to maintain a proper lookout at all times. Underline, at all times. Using eyes, ears, and any other means available. Which includes radar. When and if you have one. When it's in a working condition and you know how to use it. <clears throat> Actually, the argument would be very difficult if you had it and you had an accident to claim you didn't know how to use it. Because the Coast Guard has always said every operator of a vessel shall be totally familiar with all the safety and navigation equipment on the vessel he's operating. <coughs> <coughs> Another point to think about with the lookout is that he shall be assigned no other responsibilities. Hard to say when you hit the guy, well, yeah, there was a guy uh, painting up on the uh, bow of the boat. He was my lookout. Uh, you know, he was, he was painting, but uh, he was looking out for me. It's not going to cut it in court. has to be assigned as a lookout to do nothing but keep his eye open for problems. Rule number six is safe speed. A safe speed is defined in one which a vessel can take proper action to avoid a collision, to be stopped at an appropriate distance. In determining what a safe speed would be, some of the considerations should be state of the sea, traffic density, maneuverability, state of the visibility, and interference by background lights. I covered a lot of material, so just for a second, let's go back over it. It said, a vessel shall be going at a safe speed, and my thought would be that if you had an accident, you're probably not going at a safe speed because a safe speed would be one that would prevent an accident. Very often, depending on the visibility or the other problems mentioned here, maybe not moving at all would be a safe speed. It says to be stopped at an appropriate distance and determine what a safe speed would be, some of the considerations should be state of the sea. How rough it might be or how calm it might be, which should affect how fast you're going. Also, traffic density. How many vessels are in the area around you? Are you out at sea away from everybody? Are you in a crowded area where there are other vessels? It has a lot to do with safe speed. Maneuverability. I think maneuverability is a two-faced sword here because maneuverability, your ability to maneuver, certainly how fast you can turn, how fast you can stop, etc. And I guess also the maneuverability of the traffic density. I mean, if you're in a mitts with a powerboat, a mitts of little sailboats, you have to wonder whether they can maneuver as well as you can. So it's maneuverability in the area. State of the visibility. I mean, if you can't see, you can't be going fast. Interference of background lights. I would worry about this at night. 
you're running through a harbor or an area along the shoreline and you're looking at a city ahead of you and the lights are so confusing that you really can't see. Your visibility is being affected because of night blindness or light blindness, whichever it is, and you can't see all the shapes of the channel because of the lights behind it. Also, you might miss seeing other vessels because of their small lights against the background lights of the city might not be visible. Safe speed. Let's go on to the next one on page three, which is risk of collision, rule number seven. Now, I'm using these numbers for you to keep track in the book of where I am. No way on the test do you have to memorize what rule is what number. But let's talk about numbers so we can keep track of where we're at. Every vessel shall use every available means to help determine if there is a risk of collision. If there is any doubt, then there is a risk. Here you are in court, and you've had an accident. You're blaming the other guy, and the judge says, well, you know, when this happened, was there a risk of collision, Captain? You say, nah, there was no risk of collision until this guy came on the scene. Well, if you had an accident, there must have been a risk of collision. If there's any doubt, then there was a risk of collision. It also suggests here that every vessel shall use every available means to determine that. There are no, not an awful lot of means. One is visual observations, radar, taking bearings, the visual bearings on approaching vessels. Um, every available means. Even the radio, I guess. Let's go to rule number eight, the bottom of page three. Action to avoid collision. Action shall be positive and made in ample time. Any alteration of course and speed to avoid collision shall be large enough, large enough, to be understood by another vessel observing visually or by radar. Small course changes and speed changes should be avoided for that very reason. Make what you do obvious so the other vessel knows what you are doing. It says avoid minor course changes and minor speed changes that may not be understood by the other vessel. And it shall be done in ample time. Not when you're so close that you had an accident, but early. Turn the page. We're still talking about that same rule. Top page four. In a situation where there is enough sea room to do so, a course change alone might be the best action to avoid a close quarter situation. It means why let it happen when you can turn away from it? If there is another vessel nearby, one might not have to consider rules of the road type maneuvering by just turning away from closer contact. If necessary to avoid collision, allow more time to assess the situation, a vessel shall slacken her speed or take all way off by stopping and backing her means of propulsion. Let me read that one more time. If necessary to avoid a collision, or allow more time to assess a situation where there's doubt. A vessel shall slacken a speed or take all way off by stopping or backing her means of propulsion. That's going to be important a little later on when we read the rules which says if you're a stand-on vessel you must hold course and speed. Absolute must hold course and speed. But you're going to remember it says but if there's a doubt or a collision situation or risk of collision that you may want to slow or stop to further assess the situation. I guess the theory here is if you're going to have an accident, it's better to have it at a very slow speed or even stopped than roaring ahead into it. Now we're going to do the narrow channel rule nine. A vessel in a narrow channel or fairway shall keep the extreme starboard side. Keep to the right side of the channel. A vessel less than 20 meters in length. Whoop, 20 meters. What is 20 meters? Isn't 20 times 3 point, uh, about 65 feet, round figures? 3 times 20 is 60. I know it's a little more, so we'll round it to 65. A vessel of less than 20 meters, 65 feet in length, or a sailing vessel. Didn't say a sailing vessel is 65 feet, did it? shall not impede the passage of a vessel which can safely navigate only within a narrow channel or fairway. The word fairway means an area of traffic not necessary defined as a narrow channel but a channel. 
called a fairway where traffic is heavy or flows that just told us that a small boat small boats under 65 feet and sailing vessels any size shall not cause to run out of the channel any larger boats we assume that can navigate only inside that channel next paragraph fishing vessels engaged in fishing shall not impede any vessels in a channel circle that underline it highlight it because when we talk about rights of way later we'll talk about the rights of way a fishing vessel has over other vessels while it's engaged in fishing and you'll remember we'll come back to this little thing it said a fishing vessel if engaged in fishing really fishing under the rules and claiming to be a fishing vessel shall not use that right of way to impede any vessel in a channel saying you can fish in the channel but don't you dare impede other traffic in the channel on the basis of your right of way as a fishing vessel next paragraph a vessel shall not cross a narrow channel or fairway of such crossing impedes a passive vessel which can safely navigate only within such channel or fairway let's stay on that for a second did it say small boats big boats special kind of boats sailboats rowing boats it said a vessel a vessel is any vessel shall not cross a narrow channel if such crossing impedes it says if you have a flowing roadway thou shalt not be you car truck or a bicycle run out into traffic and screw it up it says you shall not cross if it's going to mess up the traffic flow have to wait to do it safely didn't say what kind of vessel shall not cross it said any vessel shall not cross if it impedes the traffic flow next paragraph nearing a bend or an area of a narrow channel where other vessels may be obscured by an intervening obstruction I means something you can't see around or over could be a sunken ship could be an island with trees on it could be a building could be the end of a pier with a building on it an intervening obstruction a vessel shall move with caution and sound one prolonged blast. Any vessel around the obstruction shall also give a prolonged blast. And we refer that to Rule 34, which talks about the signals. But let me tell you, a prolonged blast is between four and six seconds long. That's a pretty... I don't want to use the word long because it's prolonged, and I don't want to use the word long at all in the rules, but it says prolonged four to six. Let's go. That was four seconds. You want to do that again? That's about four seconds. It says four to six seconds prolonged blast going around a bend or intervening obstruction any vessel that's out of sight around the bend or behind the ship or behind the dock or the intervening obstruction when hearing that prolonged blast shall also give a prolonged blast to announce that it is there then the last line on that group says all vessels shall avoid anchoring in a narrow channel <clears throat> I always worried about that word avoid. To me, it doesn't say not, never, no way, shall ever. It says shall avoid anchoring. You know, you hear everybody scream at you, you can't anchor in a channel. It says avoid anchoring. I think of all those things in the rule, people will remind you of this more than anything else. And I remember a number of years ago, probably seven, eight years ago, where we had a 57-foot um, boat that had gone aground, been blown outside of a channel down near Fort Myers. And after we got pulled back in the channel out of the shallow water, we dropped a, an anchor down to keep from being drifted out of the channel while we were waiting for a vessel to come and tow us out of there. Every boat, whether it be a 16-foot outboard or a 40-foot pacemaker came by, yelled at us, you can anchor in a channel. I have a feeling that's the only rule of the road that any of them knew, but they knew it well. You can't anchor. That's not what the rule says. It said all vessels shall avoid anchoring in a narrow channel. On to rule 10, bottom of page 4. 
Traffic Separation Scheme. The object of a traffic separation scheme is to reduce the risk of collision in converging areas. Dense traffic areas or a restricted sea room limits freedom of movement by shipping. This is an area that would be at the entrance to a major harbor. And the one that comes to mind quickly is that around um, the entrance to Chesapeake Bay, which aligns traffic coming from the north New England, that which comes across the Atlantic from England, and that which comes up from the south from the South American countries, gets them in the line somewhere offshore with buoys and gets them into road road marked areas so that when they enter the channel into the harbor they're not all coming converging from different angles causing major confusion. It says a vessel shall join or leave at the termination of lane but if he cannot shall join or leave it as small an angle to the traffic flow as possible. Think of that as, a, as an expressway where you get on the entrance to an expressway and you slide in with the traffic flow and you sl slowly slide over to the action lanes. It says, shall join or leave at the termination lane, but if you cannot join and leave as small an angle. The next paragraph says, a vessel shall not cross a lane, but if he must do so, do it as nearly at right angles as possible. Now, if you are joining at a narrow angle, and other vessels using that lane will know you're joining by the direction you're taking. If you are crossing, if you came in to cross like this and went around, it would be confusing. They're saying as you cross the lane, go at right angles so the vessels using the lane will know that it is your intention to go across. Clarify the situation by angle. A vessel shall not normally enter a traffic separation zone or cross a separation zone except in cases of emergency to avoid immediate danger or to engage in fishing. I'd like you to highlight those three things. Emergency, to avoid immediate danger, or to engage in fishing. It says you can enter those traffic schemes. Obviously they're at the mouths of major harbors where the flow in of nutrients makes it great fishing ground. It would be terrible to say we have put a couple of markers there so big ships will line up and now you can't fish there anymore. They're saying you can fish. But remember that rule up before that said you shall not use that right or privilege as a fishing vessel to hamper the flow of traffic. And that goes for this too. You shall not use it. In fact, if you look over the top of page 5, we'll read that paragraph. A vessel engaged in fishing in vessels less than 20 meters, a sailing vessel or a vessel crossing the traffic separation scheme shall not impede the safe pass of vessel following the traffic lane. Simple. Let's go to rule 11. It says, conduct of vessels in sight applies to vessels in sight one another. And that's it for rule 11. It says the following rules applies to in sight vessels. Sailboats. Rule 12. This rule concerns action between two sailboats only. We're not talking about power and sail. We're talking about two sailboats. The rule says simply, starboard tack has right of way over port tack sailboats. Now, I'm sure we have a few sailors in the class and that no port tack, port tack and starboard tack. Likewise, we have a bunch of stink uh, power boaters. Didn't want to use the word stink boaters. Power boaters that may not know port and starboard tack. So let me make it simple for you. Sailboat. When you look at her, the sail is bellowed out that way. It is said to be on a starboard tack because the sail is out on the port side. I'm sorry. I just made an assumption. I assumed that you knew port and starboard never explained it to you. You might not know. So let me stop and do that. The port side 
is the left side of the vessel facing forward. The starboard side is the right side facing forward. So when you do a diagram on the test, let's stop so we don't make any silly mistakes. And let's label those sides. The right side is the starboard side. The left side is the port side. Still with me? And this is said to be then on a starboard tack. That is, the wind is coming from one of these directions, causing the sail to bend out that way, or bellow out, or bow out that way. And I guess, to keep it simple, you might say the wind is attacking the starboard side of the vessel. The wind is attacking the starboard side, and so we say that vessel is on a starboard tack if the sail is out on the port side. Conversely, or inversely, whichever you choose, if the sail was on this side, we'd say the vessel was on a port tack because obviously the wind's coming over the port rail. Now you're going to say, well, what difference does it make for right of way whether it's on a port tack or a starboard tack? Really doesn't. But we have to have a rule, and we have to pick one. So whoever wrote these rules picked starboard tack. I've heard all kinds of stories about it. Not important. It says, rule says simply, starboard tack has a right of way over a port tack sailboat. So if you have two of them on different tacks, which means they may be meeting or crossing, then the one on the starboard tack has a right of way. Then it says, next paragraph, when both are on the same tack, both port or both starboard, then the vessel to windward gives way. Obviously, I wouldn't emphasize that if it wasn't important to you. Whoop, I may be going out of camera range here. Let me bring that down a little bit. Let's assume that the wind is coming in from this angle. We would be then on a starboard tack here. And if the wind was coming in here, then the sail would be bellowing on this side, and we would be on a, a starboard, that's port, that would also be starboard tack, starboard tack, sailboat. Correct? Is that correct, womp, womp? Sure, looks right to me. I'll buy that. Okay, it says, when both are on the same tack, then the vessel to windward gives way. Now. The wind is coming in from this direction. This would be the windward vessel. The one upwind catching the wind first would be the windward vessel. And it says, the vessel to windward gives way. That's how we figure right away. Let me reduce this a little bit so I can put some more sailboat on there. And let's do sailboat heading up here on a port tack. Another vessel coming this way. Now we have to assume the wind's coming in from this direction because of the sail. And this one would be, let me mark them so we don't make a mistake. This is starboard. This is port. This is a port tack sailboat. This is port. This is starboard. This is said to be a starboard tack sailboat. Let me see if I got that right. I've been known to make mistakes while I'm staring you straight in the face. Wind coming over. The port side said to be port tack. I got that. Wind over the starboard side, starboard tack. Okay, now the rule says starboard tack has a right of way over a port tack sailboat. Starboard tack has the right of way over the port tack. Didn't say meeting situation with two vessels, it just said starboard tack, right of way over port tack. Then the last paragraph that says a sailboat on a port tack, not being sure of the tack of another sailboat, shall give way. This vessel is on a port tack. This one is in the fog. He knows there's a boat there, but he can't tell what tack that boat is on. But he's on a port tack. Then he must assume that that vessel must be on a starboard tack until he knows otherwise. It says, sailboat on a port tack, not being sure of the tack another vessel, shall give way. Shall assume the other vessel is on a starboard tack. It must have the right of way until you know otherwise. Now, if he finds, when he sees his boat, that it is also on a port tack, then we go, vessel to windward gives way. 
simple rules for sailboats. Basic and simple. If you're not a sailor, obviously it's not simple. Let's do rule 13. Overtaking. The definition of an overtaking situation is one in which the vessel's stern sees only the stern light but not the side light of the vessel ahead. Let me move my little boats around down here so we can talk about some of these situations. And now we have a vessel coming up behind another one, overtaking a vessel, would see the stern light of the vessel ahead. When we get to the section on lights, you'll find that the cutoff point for stern lights and side lights is 22 and a half degrees after the line drawn at right angles to the keel. Now, no matter how I say that to you, it's going to sound confusing. Let me say it again. When we get to the section on lights, you will find that the cutoff point for stern lights and side lights is 22 and a half degrees after the line drawn at right angles to the keel. Now, I've always believed that at this point we should have stopped and we should have talked about angles of lights before we get to that section because if you refer to it, you ought to make sense out of it. We're going to do just that. I'm going to try to get up on the camera for you a picture of a compass rose showing all of the degrees of a compass. We can get that up on there. Then we'll talk about the angles of a light and see if I can't make sense for you. Before we get into any more on lights, let's talk about the compass rose for just a second. And I know, and there'll be somebody out there remind me that when we talk about lights, we talk about number of degrees. I find it very difficult to relate to lights in degrees. Very often lights today are, are discussed as they were years ago in points of a compass. The name of this that we're doing right now is two points abaft the beam. So let's talk about points for a moment. I'll explain lights based on points, and then you can convert them back to degrees, which makes a lot more sense. On this compass rose, we now show a full compass rose, and if you can read these, and it is on the cover of your booklet, it gives 32 points. Now you can count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are 32 points, these little points. They're cardinal headings and subcardinal headings, but they are points of a compass. And each point, each separation between those points is 11 and a quarter degrees, 11.25 degrees. So if you took 11.25, which is the number of degrees between each one of these points, and multiplied it times 32 points, you'd come out with 360 degrees, which is what there is in a circle, 360 degrees in a full circuit. But we're going to talk about points, and the name of this book was Two Points Abaft the Beam. A beam being out to the side, stretch your arms out to the left and right, and then wing your arms back two points, or 22 and a half degrees. In this case, it would be um, east-southeast, which is two points behind east, and west-southwest, two points behind west. Let's go back to the board a second. Let me do a fast diagram so that you can relate to it. If we were looking down at the top of a vessel, this would be a beam, and two points abaft the beam would be 22.5 degrees, which is equal to two points abaft the beam. We talk about lights cutoffs. If you can memorize this, that we're talking about a line, two points abaft the beam and you've got every light on a vessel covered. That is a stern light covers this segment, a masthead light covers this segment, and a side light covers this segment. Everything based on the two points abaft the beam, which is what we've named this section of your course to explain rules of road. Now that I've covered that, it says in this particular paragraph, um, the definition of an overtaking situation is one in which the vessel astern sees only the stern light, but not the side lights of a vessel, saying that a vessel approaching from here, or here, or here, would only see the stern light which covers this spread, and then deemed to be 
an overtaking situation.